We light this candle in honor of Christianity. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am as nothing. We light this candle in honor of Islam. Love came and it made me empty. Love came and it filled me with the beloved. It became the blood in my body. It became my arms and my legs. It became everything. We light this candle in honor of the Sikh religion. May your clothing be the protection of God. May your food be the singing of God's praise. Drink the nectar of God's name and live long. May, med may meditation on God bring you endless bliss. We light this candle, candle in honor of the earth-based religions. As the light ascends, so too do we, expanding from our limited view of what we can do into all that we are, recognizing the sacred in each act of love, each word of support, each thought of kindness. Blessed be. We light this candle in honor of the Native American religions. Love is something you and I must have. We must have it because our spirit feeds upon it. Without love, our self-esteem self weakens. Without it, our courage fails. But with love, we are creative. With it, we march tirelessly. We light this candle in honor of Buddhism. You, yourself, as much as anyone in the entire universe, deserve your love and affection. We light the final candle in honor of Judaism. The main thing is to love. For then you do not only do the good for others, but you do a world of good for yourself. Today's reading is by Ernest Holmes. We reach God in others by reaching out from God within the self. Always the God in others will respond to the God in us, but never beyond the level of our inward spiritual awareness. If you could, take these words for a minute into the silence. <clears throat> Oh, what a blessing this day is. I am knowing that we are blessed in this oneness that we are together. <coughs> I know that the infinite love of the divine with each and every one of us brings this service and brings each and every one of us such deep blessings and awareness of love. I'm knowing that Reverend Cece is divinely 
guided. I know that the that the inspiration of God is within her, and her voice speaks the word of that inspiration. I'm knowing that everyone here is blessed by what is said and what is spoken of. I know that the Higher Mind Band is divinely and deeply blessed on each and every level. I'm knowing that our children in the back are deeply loved and supported and blessed. I'm knowing that everyone who is a part of this service has brought blessings and love here and is blessed and loved. I know that this is a wonderful, healing, blessed time. And I <coughs> would say thank you. And so be it. And so it is. We couldn't find the switch. Where's the on button? Where's the on button? <laughs> well, you probably know I was at the uh, at the Centers for Spiritual Living International Convention last week in Denver, and it was fabulous. And um, the topic today was actually one that was raised quite a bit at the convention, which. It was really nice because I could just tell you about the convention. And, uh, and it ties in very well with our topic for today, which is called, It's Like You're My Mirror. It's not an easy topic. It's actually quite difficult. It's, it's this. Our, the relationships in our lives, all of them, are mirrors for us. They mirror back to us our own loving, the way we love, our own beauty, our own goodness, our own ego trips, our own neuroses, our own selfishness, everything. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> the first part's easy. We love it when people tell us how lovable we are and how they, much they love us and how good we are. And it's not so easy when someone points out to us, not through words, but through reflection, what our BS is, what our our uh, smallness is, our selfishness, you know, that stuff that many of us have spent our lives pushing away. I don't want to know that about myself. We push it away, and it winds up in our deep subconscious. It doesn't go away just because you push it away. It's still there, and it still shows itself, and, you know, you still weird, do these weird things that, that other people see, and maybe you don't. That's kind of the way it works. Carl Jung said, everything that irritates us about others can lead us to an understanding of ourselves. Everything that irritates us about others leads us to an understanding of ourselves. See, that's difficult. It is. It's difficult. All of our relationships do that. And, and I'm going to reframe it a little for you. What a precious, priceless opportunity that is. Because these things are, we are blind to them. They are in our subconscious, which is hidden from us. So when someone else mirrors it to us, wow, we get to see it. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying it's easy. What I'm saying is, it's a precious opportunity. When someone pushes our buttons, we can stop and say, what in me is being triggered? What exists in me that that person's personality or conduct or whatever should shake me up so? What's, what's this all about in me? You know, when you think about the people, think about the people in your mind, you just really grate on you. You really irritate you. What do you see? Do you see um, selfishness or indifference or stubbornness or you know there's going to be some trait that you see and whatever it is that imperfection that makes you react negatively is an imperfection in you and it is the thing that is preventing you from being your best <coughs> and your happiest and your most fulfilled self that's just truth it's hard to swallow I don't like it when I see myself like writ large out there <laughs> no not me, please. But I know it's absolutely the truth that what pushes my buttons does so because I have the button. I have it. It's in me, right? 
But the beautiful thing is that once we acknowledge what's reflected back to us as part of us, then all those deepest fears have been unearthed. It's one of the only ways I know they get unearthed. We see them and we can finally do something with them. We can love them. We can take a deep breath, a really deep breath, and another deep breath, and another deep breath, and extend our compassion. And as we extend it to the person who's out there showing us ourselves, we're extending it to ourselves, we're embracing our own flaws, if you will, our own shortcomings. You know, I just want to say this. Uh, there's a great Buddhist, David Suzuki, or not David Suzuki. <coughs> I can't remember his first name. Suzuki, he's the Zen guy. He said, um, we are all whole, perfect, and complete as we are, and we could use a little work. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we start from whole, perfect, and complete, and most of us could use a little work. That's what I'm referring to as our shortcomings, is that those places where we could use a little work. And see, this embrace, this compassion is what the deepest part of ourselves wants from us. It is what our souls want from us. They want, our souls want that deep realization that we are one with everyone else. That we are our neighbors and our neighbors are us. We're our heroes. We're those people across on the other side of the world. We're those we are those people who we hom whom we hold up as enemies. We're all, we are all of them and they are all of us. But in order to, to, you know, in order to do that, we have to be able to extend that compassion. And I think it was Dr. Ken Gordon, who is our, our departing spiritual leader, magnificent, magnificent man, and I'll miss him very much. He said in his final address, the work of the past required us to use our hands. The work of the present requires us to use our minds. The work of the future requires us to use our hearts. It requires us to use our hearts. So in order to meet the requirements of the future, we have to be willing to find out where our hearts are, how they work, what we're doing with them these days. And how do we need to extend them? How do we need to work out the kinks in our ability to love and be loved? How do we need to find the courage to be willing enough to embrace those people who push our buttons? To embrace ourselves and the other person as ourselves. How do we find that courage? Well, here's another thing I know to be absolutely true, and this comes from our newly elected spiritual leader, Reverend Dr. Edward Viun. He was talking about a situation where he just like lost all of his spiritual grounding. His, his husband was hit by a car while we were there, and he was trying to get to Kevin, and he, and he just sort of lost it. And then he said, oh, wait, everything I need to know about what lies before me is given to me by the Spirit of God within me. And he was able to remind himself that we already have that. However you think of the Spirit of God, it is that voice within you that says, put your foot here, do this, Re reach out to this person, hug yourself, whatever is the next step. We know what to do. We, we have everything we need to find that courage and that willingness to be brave enough to out ourselves. <laughs> That's a battery signal. Uh, Stephanie Rose. Okay. Is Kevin okay? Yes, he is. So we can find the courage to out ourselves to ourselves on our own emotional BS, right? Mm -hmm. We have what it takes to find that courage to do that work. And the reverse is also true. When we see someone we admire and love, we've got to have the courage to say, that's who I am too. And sometimes that's even harder. Thank you, darling. Sometimes it's harder for us to see our beauty and our glory and our lovableness shown back to us by somebody else. But that's also what we see mirrored back to us. 
from all of our relationships. So part of what lets us do this hard work, I think, oh, you're the best, sorry. Don't be sorry, thank you. You saved me from having to shout. <laughs> Our spiritual practices also are the places we find the courage to do this work. The first one, the one I always go to, is our principal practice, affirmative prayer, or what we call spiritual mind treatment. It is not a prayer in the usual sense. It is a realignment of our own thoughts. We are treating our minds to a new way of thinking. Because the first step is to recall this thing we call the divine, and to remind ourselves that the divine is the only thing going on at any given time. It's all there is. And so, therefore, we're one with it. We are it. It is all that we are. We couldn't be anything else because the divine's the only thing happening. And, and from that springs a seed of recognition that if the divine is all there is, then not only me, but that person who's pushing my buttons <laughs> must also be of the divine, is, must also be the divine in form. And from that recognition is a total shift in perspective. It's a total shift in perspective. We can, you know, look for what we dislike and resent and see it in ourselves. We can, instead of seeing it as who they are, we can look for the divine spark that is, that must be in them. Right? And when we get to that point, there's nothing else to do but say thank you and let go because the prayer has done its work in us. The second spiritual practice that is really, really growthful in this area is meditation, because the whole point of meditation is to find out what's in your own mind. It's in that still contemplation of our own consciousness that we start to see our reactions. We start to see what it is that trips us up, that triggers us, that we react to in other people. And, and we start to see how we become attached to that reaction and go off running with it, acting from it. But we also start to see this, that every one of those reactions comes and goes. They all go. They're not, they do not have any substance of themselves. They are simply the products of the mental processes, mostly subconscious <coughs> mental processes. There's a Buddhist author who I like very much. His name is Stephen Batchelor, and he's kind of a, a Buddhist heretic, but I already told you I love heretics of all stripes, and so he's one of my favorites. He's also been meditating for more than 30 years, and he said, I have learned that the value of meditation, meditation is not that it changes the content of your experience, it changes your relationship to that content. All the worries, egotistic fantasies, lusts, and pettiness that surge into consciousness are simply the product of previous conditions. I do not choose to feel them, they simply arise. All I can do is be mindful of them as they arise, recognize them for what they are, and not let myself be too influenced or swept away by them. See, meditation lets us see what's going on in here. And it's a busy, 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 busy place, right? Stuff comes up from our subconscious, old memories, old hurts, old whatever. If we've just been triggered and tripped by someone, there they are in our meditation accompanying us. All that stuff, and then we get to be able to see our, our own reactions and our own thoughts and our own emotional responses to this situation. This stuff wells up from our conscious mind, a subconscious mind, and that's all it is. It is not a thing of itself. And right there is when we arrive at the moment of choice. When we realize that this is just our minds churning out thoughts, that's where we have choice because we can simply stop there, take a breath, take another breath, ooh, take as many breaths as, as you need until that thing goes away. Then you can decide whether you respond to it or just let it go. That's where our choice comes in, is in that little bit of space that meditation creates between what bubbles up and what we do, how we react. And over time, we get less and less and less reactive. 
through that process. But I have to tell you, reactivity will probably never leave us because we're human beings. We have this brain whose function, the brain's function, is to generate thoughts. And I don't know whether you've noticed, but about 95% of them are absolute nonsense. <laughs> and there they are. There they are, just happening and happening and happening. And so we get to arrive at that place where we have a little room to take a breath and make a choice. But we do become much less likely to grab on and ride the thought to its own self-destructive conclusion. We find in meditation ways to embrace ourselves with love so that we can embrace the world with love. And finally, there's one more spiritual practice that I really find helpful and I dearly love. It's what we here would call contemplation or even sacred reading. Uh, Lectio Divina, 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 however the Latins would pronounce it. And it simply means dwelling deeply on an idea or a passage that speaks to us somehow long enough and deeply enough that we see how profound it is and we absorb its profound message and make it our own. And somebody brought this up at the conference. I think it was Josh, um, Reverend Josh from Mile High. We were treated to one of a Wednesday night service at Mile High, which is our biggest center ever. It's in Denver and it's this giant, beautiful dome and holds, I don't know, 750, 800 people and they do three or four services on Sunday. It's a giant place. This is a little quote that comes from a radio talk that Ernest Holmes gave on April 23, 1950. He said, think for a moment about the few whom you feel are close and dear to you. Now permit your imagination to include more. Say to yourself, what would it be like if these few whom I love so much were multiplied so that finally everyone I met would arise in me, this, would arouse in me the same deep affection? Lose your small love and you will find that it is increased and multiplied a million times through greater union. Dare to lose your small love. Wow, I love that. Dare to lose your small affection. Dare to let love so grow in you that you meet more and more and more people for whom you have deep affection, the same affection you give your family and your friends. Dare to be transformed by that into one who shines the light of love so brightly the world can't help but respond. That's what we're really here for, right? In his first address, as our newly elected spiritual leader, Reverend Dr. Edward Villun, who is um, from South Africa originally, but he's been the senior minister of the Center for Spiritual Living, Santa Rosa, California, for whew, almost 30 years, I think. Started as a mere babe, a young, gangly guy with a funny accent. And he's just become an awesome, loving, profound individual. I'm so thrilled. He's our new spiritual leader. He said, um, he said that in order to do this work, we must become transformed. We must learn to let go of the little things in our minds that want us to follow them. And, and we have to be radically changed to meet the future. And he said, the way we do that is by acknowledging our shortcomings and then keep moving past them, through them, toward the, our vision of ourselves and our world. That's how we go beyond what is to what might be. That's what our philosophy is really all about, isn't it? At coming to the place where we release our hidden brilliance. Brilliance. Ouch, I just bit my tongue. Where we take this, this next step, even when we're terrified, towards that vision, towards releasing that brilliance. When we remember that we have never exhausted and cannot exhaust the potentiality of the human spirit that's within us. We certainly have, I certainly haven't exhausted it. I know that. I know that. And this is inconvenient sometimes, right? This whole thing is inconvenient. It's frustrating sometimes. That's why we're here together. 
because we support each other in remembering it. Inconvenient, frustrating, weird, all that stuff. We still keep moving toward our vision of ourselves, of our own lives, and of our <coughs> selves, the world, us, all of us, the human family. So my favorite speaker of the convention, and I'm probably going to go a little over, so you'll just have to forgive me. My favorite speaker at the convention, with possible exception of Reverend Dr. Edward, was Bishop Yvette Flunder. And Bishop Yvette comes to us from the Fellowship of Affirming Ministries, which is a something she started years ago. She's black, she's a lesbian, and she is a, she calls herself a Metabapticostal. <laughs> she was raised Pentecostal, Southern Baptist, but she's a metaphysician. And we are part of her fellowship of affirming ministries because she came to us and said, you know, you are my brothers and sisters. We think alike. We're all in this together. We all love the same way. And we said, oh yeah, we want to be your brother and sister too. So we joined her fellowship. And we get her at a lot of our meetings because of, because of that association, but even more than that because she is a kick butt speaker, inspirer. She's amazing. If you ever get a chance, go on YouTube and watch her, Bishop Yvette Flunder. So she told us, as she always does, a Bible story. Talk about a relationship that's changed, that's been transformed. I used to hate the Bible, oh man, because of something that happened in my childhood. I really didn't want to want anything to do with that particular library. But in ministerial school, I had to take three classes <coughs> to open myself up to this, this collection of wisdom called the Bible. And I have grown to love it and, and rely on it and, and ponder the depths of the stories because every one of them is transformative. So here's one, and it's one that most of us don't know very well. So after Jesus' death, people, you know, his followers started to do this thing they called the way, which was based on Jesus' teachings. And uh, it really stirred some other people up, including the Pharisees. And there was one guy called the Pharisee of the Pharisees, whose name was Saul of Tarsus. Some of you will know this story. Saul got orders from the high priest, and he traveled to Damascus to gather up as many of these Jesus followers as he could find to take them back for questioning and imprisonment and probably death, right? He hated them, and his mission in life was to exterminate as many of these Jesus followers as he could possibly get his measly little hands on. So he's traveling the road to Damascus, and all of a sudden there is a giant flash of brilliant light, and he falls down, and a voice says, Paul, why are you persecute, persecuting me? And he kind of goes, who dat? Who dat? <laughs> and the voice says, I'm Jesus. It's Jesus, and you're persecuting me. Why? Go into Damascus and wait. And Paul stands up, and he can't see anything. He's blind. And the people that are with him say, we heard the voice, but we didn't see anybody. What is going on here? And they, you know, they're all freaked out. They take him by the hands. They lead him into Damascus. In Damascus, there was a Jesus follower whose name was Ananias. And about three days after Paul's blinding, Saul's blinding, uh, Ananias heard that voice, that same voice. And it said, Ananias. He said, yeah. He knew what was coming. The voice said, Ananias, you must go to this house on Straight Street and you must cure Saul's blindness. And Ananias says, oh no, oh no, this is the guy who hates us. This is the guy who wants to put us in jail. This is the guy who wants to put us to death. I don't want to go to Ananias. And God says, Ananias, he is the one whom I have chosen. Now go. Whew. So Ananias goes to the house on Straight Street. He puts his hands on Saul's eyes, and, uh, and Saul's blindness is healed. This is Saul who became Paul. And you all know about Paul and everything that came after that. Well, if you don't, anyway, he's the one that's responsible for everything after the Gospels and the building of the Church of, of Christianity and all of that. 
What? <laughs> you say something about Minnesota? St. Paul, Minnesota. Oh, St. Paul, Minnesota. Duh. Sorry, I'm not very quick today. Anyway, so Ananias went and did this work. And that Ananias work is why we're here. That kind of love is why we're here. And it's not easy. Ananias work is not easy. It's hard for us to love somebody that we don't like. It's hard for us to love somebody that we think is against us. It's hard to extend our hearts to someone who, have, who has just mirrored to us the parts of ourselves we'd rather not look at. That is the work of Ananias. That is our work. It's the work of the heart to do that, to understand that there's something more for us in that exchange than what we react to. The work of Ananias is to say, yes, I'll do it. I will go to this place with love. Dr. Kathy Hearn, who was our spiritual leader until Dr. Ken Gordon took over, said, here's the one thing I've learned. It is all about the learning. It is all about the growing. Everything that comes is about the expansion of the heart. That's what the future requires of us, my friends. It requires us to use our hearts, to be willing to show up with our hearts full of love no matter what, for ourselves and for our neighbors as ourselves. Even the neighbor up the street from me with whom I could not be more uh, philosophically opposed, shall we say. <laughs> And that's what we've come prepared to do. This is the, you know, the work of our lives. Each one of us is the Ananias of our time and our neighborhood. Each of us, no exceptions, is the place God lives and moves and has its being. Each of us, even those people that trip our triggers and push our buttons, this is the place God shows up. So it's time for us to show up in love, with love, and it has love.